If you're a guest here at Grace Mall First Baptist Church, we want to welcome you. And we want to say thank you for choosing to spend your Sunday morning with us. We promise you you'll catch more fish here than the pond. And we want to tell you that we love you for just who you are and for just how you came in. And that every single person here that looks pretty on the outside, I promise you isn't as pretty on the inside. So when it comes down to it, we're all the same. And we're all here at the watering hole in need of a drink. And we're all beggars trying to tell another beggar where the bread is. And this is where the bread is today. It's in God's Word. Now, we're going to cover a verse that is very familiar to you. And we've, as a matter of fact, we've covered it one time in a Sunday morning service last year, and we covered it one time in a Sunday night service last year, as we were going through the book of Philippians verse by verse. But it's a very familiar verse to you, so much so that I would say some of you guys probably have it by memory. You could probably recite this verse. So what I want you to do is not to let your familiarity, not to let how familiar this verse is get in the way of the fresh word that God wants to bring this morning. Okay? All right, Philippians chapter 4. And for the next three to four Sundays, I know the last Sunday, the 29th, we've got Mike Napier coming in. But for the next three to four times I'm in the pulpit, we're going to be going through a series of mental battle Mental warfare, spiritual warfare. And we're going to go through it by addressing the first culprit on the battlefield, and that is fear. And just so you know where we're headed, just so you know the trajectory of where we're going to be at, we're going to be covering verses 6 through the end of the chapter. Well, 6, yeah, through the end of the chapter. So that's where, not today, but in the next three or four weeks, Slim's like, oh, goodness. We only got 20 minutes, 19 minutes, Slim. All right. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. If your body is able and you are willing, please stand in the honor of reading God's holy word. The holy sacred scriptures say, Do not be anxious about anything, but in Everything, my prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Heavenly Father, I pray at this moment that you would shine your light of understanding upon the Scripture. That, Father, what we think we know would be overshadowed by the amazing truth that you will reveal today. We love you, we praise you, and we give you all glory, all honor. And it's in your precious Son, Jesus Christ's name, that we pray this prayer. Amen. Have a seat. If you were to truly assess our world today, and I mean our world, our bubble, our microcosm of living, and then if you were to step outside your micro bubble and you were to access your surrounding world, whether it's through the county or through the state, or maybe you're looking at our nation, maybe you're looking at our world, or maybe you're just looking in your home, there's no doubt that there's something plaguing us. No doubt in my mind that there's something plaguing us, Christians and as a society today. There's a condition at work inside of us that is counterproductive to the purpose that we have as followers of Jesus Christ. And this condition is fear. Fear has lots of names. Anxiety, depression. Fear has the name of worry. And if you're a worrier this morning, you're not going to like this message. That's okay. I'm a worrier. I worry about my son. Creed battles with worry. He has a hard time going to bed at night sometimes. I have a hard time going to bed at night sometimes. Especially when he's not with me and I think about when he's away and I can't do nothing about it. And what's this happening? What if this is happening? And what if he doesn't think I'm a good dad? And what if I don't go over here? And what if I don't make that game and make that game? And what if this and what if that? And 
Creed lays in bed, and he thinks, well, man, what if this happens, or what if this happens? And then I talk to you guys, and you're like, man, my life is so crazy. What if this, what if this, what if this? And it's just fear, rampant in the church. I understand the lost being afraid. I understand the lost being fearful and worry and anxious, but what happens when the found act lost? What happens when we, who are no longer slaves to fear, become addicted and chained to the condition of worry and anxiety to the point to where it affects us physically, spiritually, and emotionally? Now, what I'm speaking this morning, understand that I'm speaking from a place of personal experience. I wish one day I had a wise pastor tell me, he said, son, be transparent, but be transparent in the areas you have victory in. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. But I just got to tell you, I'm still a new Christian. I'm still learning how to make my faith meet my life. And I'm still trying to figure out how to do this thing called every single day in the life that we live. I'm trying to figure it out. And so I don't have complete victory in this, but I see it. I see the peace in Christ. I feel the peace in Christ at times. There are moments where it feels like all is well with my soul. But then I also see that dark pit of fear, worry, and anxiety. Now listen. We have a way of over-spiritualizing things sometimes. And the church is bad sometimes about saying, oh, just let go and let God. And we act like it's not a real condition. We act like that we really don't struggle with it. But the truth is, we do. And the truths of God are only as powerful as they are obeyed. So if you want the secret, the 10 best secrets, or if you want to have your best life now, then go to the library and check out an Osteen book because it's what this is, what this is is not some kind of secret. This is revealed to us. This is accessible to everyone. This isn't hidden. God has shown us clearly what to do in these times when we wrestle with fear, anxiety, and worry. And so when I speak this morning, I'm speaking from a place of conviction and a place of personal experience, not a place of perfection. Today, I want to identify simply some truths concerning fear. The absence of peace, listen, is a visible condition. Do you realize at times I can see your absence of peace? I wonder if you can see mine at times. I wonder if there's moments where you look at me and you can see the absence of peace. It's a visible condition that can be seen where? In the attitudes, in the actions, and in the choices of our lives. Where there is no peace, there is fear and worry. Someone will reside in your mind. And you can't serve both peace and fear. You can't serve both God and money. You can't serve both Jehovah and Satan. So who's it going to be? Today I'm choosing peace. There is a steady flow of chaos that is counterproductive to the purposes of God. George and I are in discipleship together, and we were talking the other day, and it's just funny because it's just like sometimes as a man, who in here as a man battles with anger? I do. My anger is my anger is more um, self, like debilitating. I take my anger out on me. I get I I I don't have big. If I get loud, not on here, but if like if I if I start getting angry on the outside, it's usually a bad thing. I'm usually too far gone. But I struggle with anger. I do. I, I get mad at people. I get mad at circumstances. I get mad at myself. And it's crazy. And George and I were talking. It's just like sometimes there's this steady river of chaos flowing through our lives. It's like we're just constantly suppressing the beast. It's like we're just constantly a time bomb waiting to explode. And everyone around us has got to walk on eggshells because we refuse to live in the peace of God. And I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it in my life. I'm tired of it in your life. 
What happens when those called to live in peace begin to live in anxiety and fear? Anxiety causes all sorts of things medically. Listen, the New York Medical Journal documented this fact. Tell me if you relate to this. Ready? I don't care what time it is, by the way. Ready? Anxiety causes a fear to act. Have you experienced that? Have you been afraid to take the step? Okay. Anxiety causes hesitation. You ever been deer hunting? And you see the deer, and you get it in your scope. And Sam says, take the shot, Blake. And Blake stinking hesitates. And then I shoot and I miss. It's a real story. <laughs> anxiety, check this out, causes seclusion. Anxiety causes depression. I was talking to someone the other day. You know what they told me? I don't want to get out of bed. I just don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to get out of bed. I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to talk to anybody. Y'all relate to that? Anxiety causes discouragement. Listen to this. Anxiety causes unwise and harmful decisions. Listen to this. Anxiety causes scientifically physical sickness. Anxiety causes spiritual backsliding. Anxiety causes distrust and unbelief. See, I believe that it's the Christian's call to live in the peace of God. Why? It's within the peace of God that we glorify Jesus Christ. And it's in our glorifying of Jesus Christ that we fulfill the call that God has given every man, woman, or child that belongs to him. Sometimes the church has to be reminded of what it should look like because the world is watching. Right? Hey, I've been in the street. Preston, you've been in the street. We know what it's like to look in on the church and to watch them and to say, those guys say they got it figured out. Those guys say they got the peace and the love of God. Let's see. Let's see how they are at the diner. Let's see how they are in, in, at the four-way stop in front of the bank. Let's see how they are when they don't know we're listening in the post office. Let's see how they are when they have no idea that we're watching them. Let's see if they have it. Paul had to remind this church in Philippi. He saw that they had real life circumstances that were going down in their community. They had real life circumstances that were going down in their church. They had real life circumstances that were going down in their family. And Paul had to bring them some practical, understanding relief to their mind. He said, do not be anxious. That is a command. That's a command in the imperative tense that says, right now, right this second, draw a line in the sand and say, I choose fear no longer. <laughs> yes, brothers and sisters, you have that power. You know what? I understand the riots and the political unrest. I understand it. I understand why people are freaking out. There's no peace. There's no peace. The people that were supposed to live in the peace of God were slowly beginning to live in the fear of the enemy. Paul knew the key to peace. Paul knew that the key to peace was delighting in the Lord. I'm saying this like you've already been in study with me because I've been in this text for a while now, but I say Paul knew the key to peace because at the beginning of this letter, Paul was chained up to a Roman prisoner and he told the church, he said, listen, I've learned to be content in all things. I've learned to be content when I have a lot, when I have a little, when I have enough, when I don't have enough, I'm content because I'm in the peace of God. It doesn't matter if I'm in chains. It doesn't matter if I don't have food. It doesn't matter. Why? Because I am in God. Therefore, I choose the peace of God. Paul knew the delighting in the Lord was the key. What's delighting in the Lord? Go ahead, ask. Oh, thank you, Sam. Thank you for asking. Psalm 1, 1 through 2, we were in this last month. 
Oh, the joy of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around the sinners or join in the mockers. Verse 2, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. To delight in the Lord, are you ready? Is to consistently pursue and contemplate the word of God with the intention of obedience. To delight in the law of the Lord is to consistently pursue the word of God with the intention of obedience. That's what we're doing today. I need change. So I intend to obey where we're at. Philippians 4, 6, the verse part, do not be anxious for anything. The first truth I want to identify today, and I've only got two, so don't worry. Anxiety is problematic in the life of a Christian. Anxiety is problematic. What does that problematic mean? It has the tendency to create problems in the life of the Christian. The word anxious means to fret or to worry. It's an indication of a lack of trust in God's wisdom, sovereignty, and power. You know what happens when you worry? You say, God, I'm going to move you out. And I'm going to resume your position. I'm going to take responsibility of this, God. Obviously, your sovereignty does not stretch to my life. Obviously, your grace cannot carry this situation, so therefore, I will assume the responsibility of divinely figuring this out. I will worry about it, God. You're not doing your job. It makes God look really poor to other Christians. It makes God look really poor to a lost community. Because you basically say, God, you're not sovereign enough for this. You're not in control enough for this. You don't know the depths of my situation, God, so therefore I will worry about it. The Philippians were beginning to worry, and that worry was starting to affect their faith in God. They were beginning to doubt God's power, and they were beginning to doubt God's sovereignty. See, when we worry, we gain a high view and opinion of ourselves and a low view and opinion of God. We begin to think, well, maybe I can figure this out. Maybe there's something I can do about this, and the reason I need to act is because God can't. So therefore, I will do it. Why? At the, at the center of that is, a, is, is an idolatry. You know, what, you know what we're really saying when we worry? We say, I am God. That's really what we do. I am God. Therefore, I will worry about this instead of trusting what did the church have going on? Well, they were suffering persecution in their faith in chapter 1. They had people in the church that couldn't get along. And as a result, they were growing, had a growing spirit of animosity between people inside the church. Verse 27, chapter 1. They had false teachers coming in and attacking the very cross of Christ. In chapter 3, the Christians here at Philippi had physical needs. They had needs like food. They had needs like shelter. They had needs like clothing. <laughs> Their life was a mess. They had every reason, according to the world, to be anxious. But guess what? They weren't called to live according to the world. They were now to live in Christ and through Christ. They had God within them. Paul says, the beginning of verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. Well, but the swine flu is going around. No. Do not be anxious about anything. Well, but my finances are. Do not be anxious about anything. You know who else said that? Jesus Christ. Turn with me to Matthew 6. Matthew chapter 6. I mean, like, it's crazy. All week long, I'm, like, building up all this stuff to tell you guys. And I get up here, and I'm like, man, I got to rush. I got to rush. I ain't rushing. Matthew chapter 6. Look at verse 25. Now, listen. Tell me if this don't hit home. Verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, what? 
Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food? Is not the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, which one of you today, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? You know what anxiety is? It's worthless. It accomplishes nothing. Nothing. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Or, Let's keep going. Uh, what shall I do in my marriage, or what is my son going to do, or how am I going to get over this, or, or what's going to happen here? He says, for the Gentiles seek after these things. The world seeks after that. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. And then here it is, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Then verse 34, same command. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient is the day in its own trouble. <clears throat> Guys, today we're just wetting the plate. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just setting the table for where we're going to be at in the next couple of weeks. I just want you to know it's a problem. I just want you to know it's a real problem. It's a real problem that we really do deal with. And it really does have very real effects on our marriages, on our lives, on our personalities. My brother's single. And the other day he said, what if I'm going to be single the rest of my life? What if, what if, what if this? What if, I mean, and it's, it's just nuts. It's nuts. It's crazy. And we do it again. And we do it again. And we do it again, right? And it's insane. And the whole time. The Word of God says, listen, choose. Choose today. Don't be anxious today. Paul's saying to them, and he's saying to us in Philippians 6, the same God that clothes the wildfires, flowers, the same God that feeds the sparrows, the same God who spoke creation into existence, the divine source of resurrection power, the author and finisher of faith lives within you. So, do not be anxious about anything. God is greater than your situation and is the provider of all that is good. And he lives within you. So child, don't be anxious. Anxiety has no place in the life of a Christian. Paul doesn't just tell them not to be anxious, but he gives them a prognosis. He gives them a treatment plan. He says, listen, you're diseased. You're diseased with fear. You're diseased with anxiety and it's time it stops. So here, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to stop all the self-help crud on the outside of your life, and you're going to start realizing that it's right here in your mind. This fear, this worry, it's not based on reality. It's not based on actual circumstances. It's based on made-up stuff inside your head. So right now, grab a hold of the truth that you do know and choose not to be anxious. And how are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? We're going to find out next week. But if you read on in verse 6, he tells you, you're going to do that by a very simple Christian discipline that's been practiced for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's the same thing your grandma's been doing for you forever. It's the same thing my grandma did for me forever. And we're going to pray. We're going to pray. That's how we're going to deal with this. We're going to take our worries and our cares, and we're going to take them to the Lord. What needless pain do we bear, right? All because of what? Because we don't take everything to God in prayer. 
And so today, what I want you to do is I want you just to begin to allow your mind just to entertain the idea that you can choose. Just entertain that idea that you can choose not to be trapped by anxiety, fear, and worry. Because we're going to be in this for a little while because it's a serious thing. It's a serious thing. It plagues me. It plagues people in this church. I've seen it at work in my kids' lives already, four years old. Don't need to worry about stuff, right? But they watch mommy and daddy worry, right? So we're going to stop this together as a church. We're going to start it by prayer. As the invitation team comes forward, Heavenly Father, right now, we acknowledge that you are sovereign, you are in control, you are God, you are perfect. Father, you are sufficient, you are creator, you're sustainer. God, you are all that is good. Father, you are, you are love. God, you are peace. Father, you are all that is perfect. You're the author of perfection. And God, yet you choose to put yourself inside such broken vessels. Such broken people, God, who curse you with one day with their lips and bless you the next. And yet your grace abounds day after day. You still beat our hearts, God. You still put breath in our lungs. There's so much at work that is keeping us alive, and it's all being held together by the power of Christ. So, Father, right now we want to say that may we not waste another breath on fear because fear is a liar. God, you are truth. So, Father, I don't know how this applies. I don't know what this means to the people in this room, but I do know what you're doing with it in my heart. And God, you do call us to have righteous anger. God, you call us to hate sin. And I'm really beginning to have a distaste for fear, God. So please, Lord, give me the strength to model this with my brothers and sisters here. Give me the strength, Lord, to model this in my home with my wife and with my son and with my daughters. And Father, I pray for those in this room right now, God, who are hurting and broken. Father, who need help, who need hope, who need something other than what's been happening lately. God, give them peace today. Father, wake them up, Lord. Wake them up, God, to your reality of your love for them. Father, enable them to choose life, God. Give them the strength now to pursue you, to cast their cares, to take upon them your yoke, your burden, God. We thank you for the gospel message that is simple, Father, the gospel message that states that sin separates us from you, Father, and that you love us enough to send your son, Jesus Christ, to come to this earth and live a perfect life and then get to that point, God, where he has to have that payment of sin placed upon him through his death on the cross. And God, it was my sin that was nailed above his head as his crime. It was my sin, Lord, that drove those nails into his hands. And the gospel message is that my sin was paid in full by Christ's death. And that, Father, three days he was buried, and he rose again on the third day, conquering death in the grave. And in him we have power, resurrection, hope, and life. And that, Father, if one man, woman, or child would simply confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that God raised them from the dead, and they would turn from themselves and turn to you, Father, your word says they will be saved. So may that happen today, God. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. If you want prayer this morning, come down. We'll pray together. Three hundred without him. Number three hundred, and please stand. (laughs) Without him I could do nothing. Like a ship without a sound, Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? Do not turn him away, oh 
Jesus, oh Jesus, without Him how lost I would be, without Him I could be dying, without Him I'd be But with Jesus, thank God I'm saved. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know Him today? Do not turn Him away, oh Jesus, oh Without Him, how lost I would be. All right. <coughs> well, <coughs> uh, can't hear. Oh, this is your pastor calling. Um. So listen, if you're if you're a generous person, um, I want you to tune in. And if you're that person that's saying, I'm tired of the church, always telling us they need money, then I want you to tune out, okay? I want to talk to the givers in the room. We're going to have an opportunity tonight for you to give, no matter how big or small you have, okay? doesn't matter. It matters where your heart is and what God's calling you to do. And there's lots of ways to give. We've got a guy that's going to... Latvia that needs money because his money was stolen. We've got persecuted Christian named Osman in Turkey that's about to lose his home that we're raising money for now. There's ways you can give, okay? David Kath is going to be here tonight, and he's like a modern-day Paul. I don't know how else to describe him, but he's an awesome dude, and I want you to come hear him, and we're going to take up a love offering. We'll, we'll have it in the back available to give if you want to give tonight, okay? But come see David Kathy, um, and tonight at 6. And if you've got any questions about upcoming events, be sure to call me. My number's on the back of the phone there, or phone, back of the, you know. Um, we got VBS dates, 16th through the 20th, July 16th through the 20th. Um, I think this evening, it's like National No Bake Sunday, I think. So is that on Sunday nights? Oh, no more No Bakes. Tuesday. Oh, yes, Tuesday's the BBS thing. And here, check this out, man. They're going to bring in a guy on how to share the gospel with children. They're going to bring a guy in that specializes in sharing the gospel with kids. So if you're interested in going, come, okay? And the 29th, get as many people as you can here. We've invited all the churches in our association. Sandy Basham sent out a blast email, spammed everybody. And we're going to do a 3 o'clock service here, okay? Free Evangel Cubes for everyone that comes. What's an Evangel Cube? We'll come and you'll find out. <laughs> Five o'clock discipleship teams meeting with Waylon. Anything else? All right, I'm ready to eat. Let's get out of here. Jamie, will you close some prayer?